Hello, good evening. We're almost to a Thor's day. So happy Wednesday, happy Wednesday evening. And I wanted to get some more in on this book, Seership, Guide to Soul Sight and the Magic Mirror and How to Use It by Pascal Beverly Randolph. So we're into the second portion of this book and um, there's never any really good stopping spots, but I know where I left off. So we're going to jump right back in there. Justice is so late of arrival to all original thinkers, the terms of prejudice and of astonishment, not in the good sense, are so long in falling off from profound searchers that even now the Rosicrucians, in other words, the Pericles Periclesians or Magnetists, which links to 47, are totally ignored as the Archchemists, arch chemists, it's one word, archchemists. I love it! <laughs> are totally ignored as the archchemists to whose deep thoughts and unrelaxing labors modern science is indebted for most of its truths. And so that magnetists to 47 says they have been known as hermetists. Periclesians, alchemists, and in France, especially as magnetists. Hey, Jackie! Yeah, one, one, one! So good. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is the coolest. That's the coolest uh, picture you sent me. Oh my gosh. These things, they happen for reasons. Oh my goodness. Damn. Yeah, right. I really think it's going to work out. I'm going to get down there somehow. I already had the day off. Oh my gosh, it's going to be great. All right. As astrology, not the jugglers of the stars, but the true exploration, seeking the method of being and of working, of the glittering habitants of space, as astrology was the mother of astronomy, so is the lore of the hermetic brethren, miscalled in only one of their names, and that the popular Rosicrucians, the groundwork of all present philosophy. In its applied side, Rosicrucianism is, a, is the very science which is so familiar and so valuable. But as the hermetic beliefs are a great religion, they, of course, have their popular adaptation and, in consequence, there is a mythology to them. There must always be a machinery to every faith through which it may be known. And the mistake of people is in accepting the childish machinery and the coarsely but fitly colored mythology of a religion for the religion itself and all of it. Hence, the Rosicrucians' supposed doctrine of the invisible children of the various elements, its sylphs or sylphids, its kobolds. Oh, something just bit me. Mother of pearls. Oh, it got me good. Hey, Delaney Pearl, welcome. I wonder what that was. Okay. Um, and all of it. Hence, the Rosicrucian supposed doctrine of the invisible children of the various elements, its sylphs or sylphids, its kobolds, Crows, gnomes, kelps, or kelpies, its salamanders and salamandrines, and its undines. Hence, all the picturesque but necessary catalog of paraded items of belief to constitute it a system that the vulgar might accept as reconcilable with sense. It is surprising that brighter intelligences have not perceived all this as only coverings and concealments. It ought to be seen at once that it is not possible to display certain things. Mystics are the chief priests of every religion. For perhaps there never was a worse founded supposition than that knowledge was for all people, than, than, than that knowledge was for all people. The minds of some classes of individuals never grow. The minds of some classes of individuals never grow. Man, what a statement to say, though. Is that really true? I don't know about all that. 
Men who arrived at the last of their mental possibilities are as much children to the higher intelligences and are as unfit for their knowledge, which has, however, the great merit of being sure to be disbelieved, as the children, knowledge to whom, of higher things than their capacity admits of, we conceal and falsify in nursery talk. All that has yet been disclosed of the beliefs of the Rosicrucians is fable fitted only to the comprehension of those who demanded a mythos as the first necessity of a faith. As more and more of the light is kindled in the mind, so is the disciple introduced into the greater and greater truth. As he himself becomes fit, so are things fitted to him. And in the mystic sense, and because it is mystic, the only true sense when men leave their settled facts and more towards and move towards things assumed and unbelievable, they only, and an inverse process, as it were, approach the real facts and leave their children's stories and fables. Dude, is there a freaking bug in here <laughs> do you guys see it like a mosquito i haven't even seen a mosquito yet this year but i don't know i've got the heebie-jeebies <laughs> okay <laughs> <clears throat> and in the mystic sense and oh wait and because it is mystic i already read all that children's stories and fables they only, by an inverse process, as it were, approach the real facts and leave their children's stories and fables. Mystical, fantastical, and transcendental, nay, impossible, as the studies and objects of the Rosicrucians seem in the modern ultra-practical days. It is forgotten that the truths of contemporaneous science are all based on the dreams of the old thinkers. Out of natural philosophy, the occult brethren sought the spirits of natural philosophy, and to this inner heaven, so unlike ordinary life, through purifications, through invocations, through humbling in prayers, through penances to break the terms of body with the world, through fumigations and incensing to raise up another world about them, and to place themselves en rapport with the inhabitants of it, through the suspension of the senses, and thereby to the opening of other senses, to the shedding out of one state, in order to the passing into another state, to all this the Rashacrucians sought to reach. So that ends with the 48, which says, admittedly, not an easy path to follow, and for this reason, the fraternity and its labors will not speedily become popular. Only the proportionately few are willing to follow the leadings of the law. This is also the reason why the authentic schools enroll one acolyte while the clandestine organizations, by offering the secrets and mysteries of heaven and earth plus a path of roses, enroll thousands, only to disappoint them and throw them back into the world with a loss of faith and weaker than they were while living in their original ignorance. Wow. Page 88. Yeah, so many mouthfuls. <laughs> Holy majoli. <laughs> By the philosophed own, we acknowledge that we mean the magic mirror, or translucent spirit-seeing crystal, in which impossible-seeming things are disclosed. The menstruum, or universal dissolvent, the transmuting element, the elixir vitae, or a power of general regeneration, magical means in their widest sense, a capacity to deal with the materials of nature until quite contrary things are evolved of them. Every phase of impossible knowledge has been assumed of these philosophers. That soon, outside of our material nature, the grand lights begin to shine, was their, was their argument. But by the vulgar, their accomplishments were suspected as the forbidden golden keys of the very treasure house in which lie the means of unlocking the gates to the immortal knowledge. Those who take up these volumes will see, by what is advanced in this concluding chapter, that they deal with no crude or inconclusive fancies of merry of merely of merely of merely enthusiastic imaginative theorizing people, nor that they are to be 
defrauded in the unconscientious work sought to be diverted from solid judgment in the flimsy actions, oh, flimsy attractions, nor simply seduced in the plausibilities of the book, of the bookmaking tribe, traitors compelled or lured to the great commonwealth of letters. Hmm. That was really choppy for me. I think I'm going to read that again. I'm pretty sure that I just keep getting beat. I'm just, I'm being eaten alive right now. It's super great. I have like at least five bites on my legs now. There's a freaking, I don't, oh gosh. Please leave me alone. Please stop sucking my blood. I don't, I've never even seen it. Oh my gosh, I'm such a complainer, but dude, I'm real itchy. Meh. Hey, 11-11. Mother of pearls, dude. Okay, well, you know what? I need to like put some pants on or something. I have to put some pants on. Real one, one second, y'alls. Stop, Cam. Hey, baby, you can sit there. What's up? Are you getting eaten? I am. Ah! Damn, Bean! What's <laughs> up? Okay. Mother of pearls. Oh my gosh. Hey, um, maybe not something that good. Those these, yes. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh right. Better. Yeah, it is a rough read. <laughs> Shoot, dude. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm so paranoid. Everything I feel, I'm like, is it, is it biting me? Okay. So. That soon, outside of our material nature, the grand lights begin to shine was their argument, but by the vulgar, their accomplishments, that's interestingly, okay. but by the vulgar, their compliments, uh, or, but by the vulgar, their accomplishments were suspected as the forbidden golden keys of the very treasure house in which lie the means of unlocking the gates to the immortal knowledge. Those who take up these volumes will see by what is advanced in this concluding chapter, that they deal with no crude or inconclusive fancies of merely enthusiastic, imaginative, theorizing people, nor that they are to be defrauded in the unconscientious work sought to be diverted from solid judgment in the flimsy attractions, nor simply seduced in the plausibilities of the bookmaking tribe, traitors, compelled or lured, to the great commonwealth of letters. The second volume of Curious Things by Hardgrave Jennings, FRC, from which copious extracts have been made herein, in which will be found some very original and interesting speculation, points as its keynote, as it were, to the following well-supported thought. Surprising, uh, the, the well-supported though surprising assertion or assertion <laughs> that extraordinary race, the Buddhists of upper India, of whom the Phoenician Canaanite Melchizedek and uh, was a priest who built the pyramids, ancient mythologies of the world, which however varied and corrupted in recent times were originally one and that one founded on principles sublime, beautiful, and true. 
And at this stage of my book, I may, with propriety, cease addressing, addressing in the formal and distant third person, and in my individual capacity, assure the kind reader, who has accompanied me thus far and so long, that the volumes upon which he has been occupied have been the full work, in one manner and another, of two years. I first formed the notion of such a book as this at no less distant a date than nine years, namely, in 1851. It was in October 1858 that I first commenced upon these volumes, except a certain interval from December 1859 until the succeeding March, when I was otherwise occupied. The task has held me, uninterruptedly, down to the present. Twenty years of metaphysics are exhibited in the conclusions of this book. They have, thus, the guarantee of delay and of thought. Much thinking produces good acting. Distributed as over the wide and heaving sea of history, most numerous fragments, evidently of a mighty wreck, most wonderful the ship, and of materials, and of design portentous, of design portentous and superhuman, have floated as to the thinker's feet. Chips, as of strange and puzzling woods, pieces that dissevered bore no meaning, Contradictory objects, diverse matters, only through keenness, with suspected relation, a beam, portions of rope, the angle of the, of the prow, items that, by long guessing, could alone be discovered to have once constituted a fabric. These have been, as it were, gathered up and built into the whole Argo, humbly, in my book. And I have sought to reconstruct a majestic ship and have traced the celestial and the sublimest story which we have which we have which we have aired unknowingly through the ages whether i have succeeded in demonstrating the philosophical possibility of the supernatural i am not to be the judge there are seven distinct magnetic laws which when obeyed and enforced cannot possibly fail of producing given effects or results and the first of these and without which but little can be done either with reference to oneself or another is persistence of purpose to given end aim and purpose that was all in caps my own career is a proof case in point many years ago i made the discovery elsewhere announced that most of human ills, social, domestic, mental, and moral, were the result of infractions by excess, entire continence, or inversion, therefore perversion, of the sexual passion and instinct common to the human race. But there was no known cure for those evils, and I was therefore compelled to search for one in the regions of the unknown. With certain speculative and transmitted data to start from, I began, and for long years continued, the investigation of the matter with a persistence, patient research, and strength of will that shrunk at no obstacle, admitted no possibility of defeat or failure. The result of that persistence is before the world, which this day acknowledges that I have perfected a series of nervovital agents better than have yet been produced on the globe to relieve the nervous troubles of mankind no matter whether they result from excess or inversion of the sex instinct of mankind, or from prodigal waste of life from overstudy, sedentary, indoor life, or excessive mental, moral, or nervous toil. The second law is that of attention. Condensed, steady, concentrated attention to and upon the person, object, principle, purpose, or thing intended or attempted to be achieved. The exercise of this power will increase the general mental strength rapidly. The third law is calmness, quietude. Nothing can be gained by equal, by eb ebul eb ebullition, by e ebullition. I have to look it up. Nothing can be gained by ebullition, hurry, excitement, especially in matters pertaining to seership, by any means whatever, 
because it destroys the direction and volume of the magnetic currents and scatters to the winds what ought to be a steady, waving flow of power. Eb ebullition? 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 Let's find out. Mm. Oh, yeah. I am, I'm tired. It's been a long day, but I really wanted to read a little, just a little bit more on this one. Ebullition. The show went really good tonight. It was so fun. Ebullition. The action of bubbling or boiling. Ebullition. Ebullition. Cool. It's archaic. Because the bath is now so cold, no further violent ebullition will occur. Ebullitions. Cool, I really like that. I never heard that before. Nothing can be gained by ebullition, hurry, excitement, especially in matters pertaining to seership, by any means whatever, because it destroys the direction and volume of the magnetic currents and scatters to the winds what ought to be a steady, waving flow of power. The fourth magnetic law is that of will, not persistence in or of, but will itself, the it shall be as I want it power of the soul. It is the central pivot about which all the others rotate and receive their impulsion toward the ends aimed at. Hmm. <laughs> The fifth law is that of intensity, which needs no explanation. The sixth law is that of polarity, the most important one of all, because without it, not much can be done. With it, there is no human being, but can be reached and influenced to a degree perfectly astonishing, as I have demonstrated in a hundred cases, one of which shall serve as a lesson. Mrs. A, for instance, having heard that I sometimes give lessons of a psychical character, comes to me with the old story that her husband's love has grown cool, that he is attracted elsewhere, and she is wretched in consequence, and wants to draw him back by magnetic or any other equally sure, innocent, and certain means. If she already possesses a good magnetic mirror, all the better. If not, I tell her to borrow one from a friend and use it as here and after directed. And I begin by inquiring the height, complexion, color of eyes and hair, approximate weight and build, and age of her husband. This to determine his temperament with reference to her own. Suppose she is a blonde and her husband a brunette. These are the proper relative temperaments, and such ought to be a happy union. And they twain disagreeing. I conclude that the fault is mainly her own. She is, very likely, too cold, exacting, imperious, disobligating, heedless of him, non-caressive. And I tell her to correct these faults in herself to begin with, for such a man with such a temperament will be quick, impulsive, passionate, restive, and full of angles. Yet, armed with love, the blonde wife can not only subdue him, but win him from any, from any brunette woman under the sun. How? Blondes are electric, brunettes are magnetic, and very susceptible, susceptible to influence, influences steadily brought to bear upon them. What if you're both? <laughs> Interesting. You know, hey, Mr. Hugh, welcome in. My mom told me tonight at the show that she was like, did you color your hair? It looks so light. And I was like, no, I haven't. I haven't colored my hair in years. And um, yeah, it does look lighter today though, doesn't it? Isn't that weird? I told her it's just because I washed it. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. It's just getting lighter in the sun. Yeah. I don't know where I left off in here. So she's got to correct her faults. And okay, yeah, the whole hair color thing. 
Dang, right? So <sighs> blondes are electric, brunettes magnetic, and very susceptible to influences steadily brought to bear upon them. His weakest point, and therefore greatest want, is caressive love. Let the blonde wife play that card, and her game is won. And that is what is meant by polarity. Let her set before the mirror, bring up his image before her therein, and when it is steadily fixed before the soul's eye, let her bring all the other six laws to bear upon it, him crowning all, as she looks upon him with true, pure, wifely desire. But suppose both parties are blondes. It is evident that caressive love won't do there, because both are of the same electric temperament. And the straying husband, nine chances in ten, has become fascinated with some dark-eyed, dark-haired, olive-hued, passional woman whose warm, magnetic nature is altogether fascinating, and chains him with bands of triple steel. <laughs> well, in that case, the wife must attack him through the door of his higher nature and prove to him by her steady, unchanging treatment of him that soul is superior to body, mind to mere beauty. So, solic solicitude, solicitude and interest, like to, to, to solicit, solicitude and interest in his affairs of more worth than whole oceans of mere professionalism or passion passionalism huh passionalism his brain and sense then form the point da, da pui in that case the polar point reverse the sexes and circumstances if you choose to do so yet the law is still the same hmm but there is another principle here that is of equal importance in all cases where a love sundering is the result of a third party's intrusion, influence, and power. Hmm. I'm reading that again. <laughs> but there is another principle here that is of equal importance. All cases where a love sundering is the result of a third party's intrusion, influence, and power. Repulsion is precisely as powerful as attraction, and we will suppose that the fault lies neither in the wife nor husband, but in a female rival of the former, who of course is just as susceptible to magnetic influences, hatred, dislike, etc., as any other human being. Well, to illustrate this very important point, once in Cairo, Egypt, I conversed with an educated Arab on this very topic and learned that it was a common custom for an injured wife to bring before her the image of the recreant husband by force of will, frequently using for want of a better, either of a glass of water or such a magic mirror, as is described in Lane's Modern Egyptians and in Mrs. Poole's English Woman in Egypt. But as there are plenty of woolies, cut, cut, I don't know how to say this. It's C-U-T-B-S, cutbs, cutbs, <laughs> and dervishes all over Egypt. It is quite an easy matter for such to gain an hour's use of a genuine glass or jewel. In this mirror, no matter whether a common one or a diamond, she invokes the simul, simul, simulacrum, sim, simulacrum, or magnetic image, sim, simulacrum, what a word, or magnetic image of the woman who has stolen her husband's affections. But suppose she does not know who the woman is. That makes not the slightest difference. All she has to do is to will the woman and no earthly power can prevent her image, wraith, picture, or spiritual form and face from appearing. When she does so, 
back on thy head, all the misery thou has happened, or back on thy head, all that all the misery thou has heaped upon mine, back to thy heart, the pangs thou has made me endure. Wow. In the name of love, whom thou hast disgraced, in the name of him who is omnipotent, I turn the love of my husband or lover, bears three, oh, bears thee unto its opposite, dislike and hatred, and in Allah's name I change thy mutual passion into foul disgust and horror. In the name of God, so may it be. Um... I don't know about all that. I don't I don't ever wish any of the heartache I've ever felt on anybody, even the people that I felt heartbroken over. I don't want anybody to feel that way. That sounds shitty. Now your practical people will probably laugh at such a method, such means, and yet in doing they laugh at God, at human love, breaking hearts, and the irresistible magnetic laws of the entire universe, universe of the great supreme. And I had rather face the devil that the solemn prayer of an injured woman, for I might escape his clutches, if he had any, but it is certain that such a message from such a woman, under such circumstances, and in such a case, would find me and fang my soul with horror wherever I might hide, because women's love is the strongest force on earth. Her cause is the purest, strongest, and most just, and all the good powers of the universe are in sympathy therewith. Nor do I believe it possible for a failure to occur, provided, uh, provided the woman be in dead earnest, and follows up her blow day by day till her magnetic victory is achieved. Wow. Hmm. Wild. But injured wives are not the only ones in Syria, Egypt, Turkey, and Arabia who have recourse to magnetic means in love affairs. For windows, oh, for widows result, resort to the identical methods, save it only a change of formulas. Gracious Allah, thou hast declared it is not good to be alone. Therefore grant that I may hear and behold one suited to me. This, supposing she had no special man for a husband in view. If she has, then she brings up his image and directs her force upon him. I have heard of many successes. I have known of no failures, nor do I see any reason why the white women of Western Europe and North America should not be quite as powerful and successful in these matters as their Arabian and Egypt Syria, Egypt Syriac sisters, Syriac sisters, or the quadroons of the South, who notoriously practice the same things to the same ends. If one of these women has no special man in view, whom she desires to have for a husband, then she continues the experiments until a series of psychovisual phantasmal faces flit across the strange, dark face of the magnetic glass, when one appears towards whom her soul yearns, as only a woman's soul can yearn, and she feels toward it as love alone can feel. She holds the simulacrum there. Am I saying that right? Right firmly, steadily, brings into active play the law heretofore explained, and forthwith impresses wherever, whoever, he may be the living original of that phantom picture, but a magnetism forceful, irresistible. The next thing is to find the man to bring the two together, and this is done by the same means. For the lucidity has often revealed localities, places, names, Seldom, however, is there a case like the above, for generally the woman already knows of the man she wants, and then her object is to inspire him, and the meeting afterward is very easy is a very easy affair. 
Of course, this whole thing is nothing but clairvoyance, pure and simple, entirely magnetic from first to last, only that it is oriental instead of western, and it is reached by methods differing from those in practice by Europeans and Americans generally, if we except a few of the wandering Zingaras and southern Octoroons. <laughs> in gazing into the profundities of the magnetic world through the agency of a mirror, it sometimes happens that very strange things are seen. As a hundred letters from mirror seers to me most unequivocally demonstrate. Occasionally an eye, emblematic of the very loftiest seership and celestial guidance, is beheld. And blessed indeed are they whom it appears, or are they to whom it appears. Recently, a correspondent in Ohio wrote me that he had beheld such a mysterious eye, and forthwith I wrote him for particulars, after his book was nearly all set up in type. Uh, the subjoined reply came to hand, which I deem of so great import importance to those who aspire to seership, that I have caused it to be printed herein, says the writer. T.C. Ohio, January 9th, 1969. Now for the particulars of that eye, or whatever it was, for some time past I have been wearing a bandage, not the improved magnetic arrangement, but the first crude substitute theref therefore. This bandage was of linen, with half a dozen thickness of heavy paper over my eyes and forehead at night, and tried to see through them. According to the directions laid down in your book, Dealings with the Dead, and your first monograph on clairvoyance, I be- oh man, I have that book in my cart. I began this practice immediately after purchasing a magnetic mirror or a magnetic or magic mirror, a second grade triune. As I sit at the present time, I soon see, see a pale golden light, seemingly misty, frequently cut with flashes of electric or magnetic light. In this soft pale golden light, there appears a spot of deep yellow gold moving about, something sometimes in a circle. After watching it for some time, it resolves itself into something like an eye, with a dark, deep blue pupil, then into a ring of gold around the eye center, then into a lighter ring of blue, resembling an eye. I first saw this object two or three weeks after I bought the mirror. The first object I saw at all was in the evening, when sitting back towards the bright, lap, uh, the bright la lamplight, I had sat about twenty minutes, impatient and discouraged at seeing nothing but a black mirror, when suddenly the appearance described above showed itself near the left-hand lower corner of the disc, slowly passing upward two-thirds the way toward the right-hand upper corner, when it suddenly disappeared. This has been repeated several times, with variations. Its size was that of a silver dime. I thought it was an unusual thing, hence paid but little attention to it. I am certainly not a seer, but thought I was tending that way. I was not satisfied because I could not see a likeness when I wished to. I can get answers enough, but not always reliable, though the future may reveal something more satisfactorily. Yours, ECT. Now, I know cases wherein that identical spot of golden light has resolved itself into an ethereal lane through which magnificent supernal realities have been seen, and other cases wherein full faces have grown out from it, and the perfect forms and the perfect forms and features of the dead been fully beheld and recognized. More than that, I have known three persons at the same time, in broad daylight, see the same things, a magnificent living picture embodying the most splendid and arabesque scenery, and I am satished, satished, sat, sat, satished, and I am satished, tat, sat, 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 I'm not sure, satished, that what 
that whoever, I think it's got to be satisfied, right? And I am satisfied that whoever can see even a single cloud pass across the mirror's face can, if they but pursue the matter, very soon develop their latent powers of clairvoyance or seership. But not all can do it, for I have known persons to try for quite a length of time without succeeding, owing to some organic difficulty born with them, persons who will probably never become clairvoyant while in the body. At this point, I will state that in any case of difficulty in developing the psychovision, though wearing, PSY, psycho, right? Yeah. The wearing of the magnetic bandage on the head at night and the magnetic plate on the body by day will go far toward removing the disturbance and obstructions beside exerting a positive curative effect if the party be at all ailing. Again, while reading the printer's proofs of this work, another letter from a lady in Oswald, New York, reaches me pertinent to the matter of the volume I quote. Oh, let me tell you that my dear father has gone home since I left Boston. I was far, far away from him. I saw my father's face, his beautiful face, and it seemed as white as snow, and his reverend hair as white as his face. Since that, he has come to me, just as I used to see him long, long years ago, long, long years agone, in the splendid prime of perfect manhood. And he conveyed to me these blessed words, My child, I am not dead. Reader, such a proof of immortality can be had by no other means, and is worth all the medium talk and oblique, indirect, and far-fetched communications in the world ten thousand times over. Another proof, while I write, the Cambridge gentleman alluded to a, alluded to a while since has just related to me the following strange experiences with his mirror. A short time ago, while looking in my mirror, my attention was arrested by the appearance of an object resembling a vast and distant mountain. Even while I gazed upon its craggy outlines, it changed into the semblance of an enormous cloud, moving toward the top of the, of the glass, dividing itself into two parts and gradually vanishing from sight. And now a train of curious but indistinct objects began to pass in panoramic order across the sublime field of the marvelous glass. Suddenly, the mirror became radiant with auroral light, and things flashed across it with electric speed. Barren religions, oh, barren regions, utterly destitute of verdure, rugged mountains, awful chasms, fearful precipices passed, immediately followed by a majestic sweep of planets, stars, suns, systems, galaxies, in awful splendor and unutterable majesty. They sailed away and seemed to leave me solitary and alone, standing hard by the confines, as it were, of an awful vast eternity, a stranger in unearthly clime, an infinitesimal moat in space, the merest speck of existence, the nearest approach to nothing, without power to comprehend the vast, boundless, limitless vault before, beneath, above, and around me, amazed at the awful sublimity, some sublimity, sublimity of the scene, I was on the point of calling for an explanation, which I undoubtedly should have obtained, when my solitude was broken by the entrance of one of those cast-iron, matter-of-fact men whose only idea is the dollar, and to my great annoyance, the mirror ceased to reflect the image of the eternal, and the seance for that time was ended. Wow. Sw oh, sweet dreams, Mr. Hugh. Yeah, you know, um, I think I'm going to call it there, too. 44, 44 minutes. Yeah. Um, how fascinating. So I just finished, I see where I am reading about that guy's experience or ladies. So cool. So uh, thanks for spending time with me, everyone. And I shall see you tomorrow, probably, right? Next time, whenever that may be. Mwah. Thank you.